So welcome back, everyone. I am Lynn Gilliland. This is uh, Lessons from Leaders. I am the host. And of course, this is my podcast that's an out, um, outreach from LG Consulting and also Humentum is our sponsor. Yay, Humentum. And I'm so lucky here to be here today with Marjorie Newman Williams, who is the president for Search for Common Ground. And the reason that I'm saying I'm lucky, and I was just telling Marjorie this, is she and I had, uh, we had Marjorie a pre-conversation. Um, and I found it to be so interesting to me. And um, I I took away so much from it that I was sorry that that wasn't our we didn't do that. That wasn't the official podcast. So I, I'm looking forward to this um, to this call this uh, this podcast interview with you. So welcome. Thank you. And just another bit, just so everybody knows, Marjorie is just six months into her role here at Search for Common Ground. So we'll um, get to also. She comes with that that perspective also being new in a new position, although she's been in, you have been in similar roles in the past. So. That's correct. So just to start Marjorie, um, what for you, when you think about your leadership journey, what were some moments that really impacted you or defined your, your leadership style that you have, that you have now? Um, one of the early experiences I had in um when I was still working in Jamaica in my early career, I'm originally from Jamaica, was um, the experience of having a quite ineffective boss. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a perfectly lovely person, but he um, wasn't very effective as a leader. And it made me start to ask the question, um, what, what was important about good leadership? And how did good leadership affect, or bad leadership, affect the people who depended on that person um, to lead? And so I began to, although I was working in, a, in, in communication and marketing, and that was sort of my, my space, I began to be curious about understanding um, whether you could learn this. And um, what were the basic things you need to know, <laughs> some mm -hmm. basic do's and don'ts about leading and managing people. So I, you know, became early in my life quite curious about um, what were things you could actually manage as a as a person in the workplace that had a, a more positive impact on the people around you. So that was early. And then um, sort of mid-career, by now I'm sort of in UNICEF and I've done several things and I'm mid-career, but I'm not very focused myself on what my leadership journey would be, or even if I was interested in one, um, I had the good fortune of being identified as a one member of a cohort of sort of mid-level people that the organization wanted to invest in. And people who we thought, I suppose the organization thought had potential to grow and develop. And that coincided with a time in the organization's history when the aspiration to increase the number of women in leadership roles at the higher end of the organization's pyramid was set, but they weren't achieving it. And um, some studies had been done to sort of identify what was making it difficult for women to grow into those roles. And I benefited from a real investment that the organization made to develop women leaders quite consciously. So I I managed to be in that group of people. Um, I had been put in a leadership role at that point as a country director, but without a lot of conscious, uh, deliberate development. And um, I was fortunate to, to be one of the group that was invested in. And it was significant investment in terms of two weeks, two weeks away from the job, three times in my mid-career life to go and work with a coach in a very inten intentional way with a group of women mm -hmm. develop our leadership. So that that really um, made me much more self-aware. Um, 
was it to to the this 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 training or this professional development was it to get you to bend to fit into the culture or to help shape the culture or was it like a two-way street or it wasn't specifically attached to the unicef culture or any okay. organization culture it really was um helping this group of women to understand where they sabotage themselves, mm. where others try to sabotage you so you can see it, know it, and cope with it. Mm -hmm. it. It was honing our abilities to do the things that um, enable you to succeed in an organization and have the confidence and to call it out when you saw it and to help other women. That was one of the things I really took away from that leadership um, experience was the importance of networking, the importance of um, being a supporter of your peer group of women and other women and young women. Um, because networking is how men did it without, um, maybe it was so embedded in the culture of men and their socialization that they seem to do it from, from the age of you know, right. boys. And so uh, networking and supporting women is a big part of what that was. And so I've made it a sort of important part of my mission to help women grow in the workplace. Do you think that it's that kind of professional development help you have confidence in who you naturally were? And so I'll just, does that, does yeah. that part of it? Yeah. It did. It validated my instincts. It taught me to trust myself. Um, it taught me that it was okay to ask for help. Mm. Yeah. And that uh, it was important to help others. That's so it really, it was reinforcing in, in my, some of my natural instincts to do that anyway, but it gave me confidence that that was, that was actually what would work well and what i'm uh, so much liking about that is at least for myself and i think for other um women coming into the workforce it's like trying to fit and thinking that what we do and how we show up isn't right because it's not we don't you know maybe it's more now but back in my day it wasn't mm. it, was, it was kind of reinforced that was an odd way of being so what i'm liking is it seems like you're reinforced your instincts, your way of being is not only good enough, it's needed there. And um, yeah, so that's, anyways, that's where yeah. I'm going with that. The models of leadership that we all inherited were not honed by us. No, they were not. <laughs> and, and, and we often tried to be more like men. And yep. in so doing, mimicking maybe even the least desirable parts of men's leadership that they themselves often wanted to leave behind. So it, it was called feminine identity and leadership, actually. Oh. And, and the idea was, it's all right to be who you are. Right. You don't, you don't have to change your identity or your natural instincts. You just have to use them in ways that are intentional. I, I, I know that that was... Um... I think that was still be relevant. That would still be relevant today. So, mm -hmm. and then, so there you are, you in this leadership development cohort and professional development, and you're making your way as, as a leader. What, what else have you learned in that journey? Um, I have learned um, to have the courage to go where I don't feel ready. Mm. Oh, please say that again, because I so want that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, when you're much younger, at least as women, we tend to think that we have to become experts at something before we try the next harder level to go up the next step. We need to spend a lot of time honing more skills. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's good to be skilled and knowledgeable. But at some point along the way, I recognized that those people ahead of me didn't know more 
weren't yeah. more people than me. And that what I just needed was the audacity to go there and to trust that I would play to my strengths and I would figure out how to compensate for my weaknesses. Um, but I could do both at the same time. And so I guess you would say courage to kind of reach beyond your grasp is one way to say it. And to be okay with that and maybe slipping and failing sometimes or getting it wrong was all okay. But just to do it with deliberateness and intention and to feel uncomfortable, you know, to get uncomfortable, get comfortable with uncomfortable was something I also realized was, was going to be necessary. I love the word audacity. And so thank you for it's such a wonderful, brave word. And I, in my own self, I have, I forget that I need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And then I remember it's really hard to be comfortable being uncomfortable, at least mm-hmm. in my own, in this, inside this head and body. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I notice is that I forget and I'm uncomfortable and I want to get out of it. And then I remember. And so did you ever get to the place that you're like, oh, just uncomfortable right now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I plateau and sit there quietly for a while. And, and then I realize that I'm bored. Mm. That I'm... I'm becoming disconnected in the sense I'm I'm behaving as if this is rote, you know, oh. and I'm not learning. And I don't like that place either. So um, my family members know this in me, is that whenever things settle down too quietly for too long, I'm going to stir it up. I'm going to do something. I'm going to, and, and I that's just who I am. So, and then I say, why did I do that? That was so easy. Why why am I now sitting in this quite uncomfortable place? And then I think, but I feel I'm growing. I feel I am learning. I feel I am not static. Do you feel that when you're learning and growing, you're actually contributing more? I just had that thought, and I don't know if I believe that to be true. What do you think? I think so, because I'm more engaged. Yeah. I'm paying attention more carefully. Um, my my energy level, my level of effort, my output, you know, you're in the striving mode a little bit. And so you're in striving internally, but you're also in doing that, maybe benefiting more people by mm-hmm. putting in more effort. I think from so i haven't obviously worked with you i haven't had that experience and just from what you're able to share right now and those the fact that you put yourself out there to be in uncomfortable situations and then you're able kind of to shout back to me and say this is what it looks like even that is a contribution you know so we can we can the end of your rope and follow you um follow your path that way so yeah Yeah. I I have a wide network of women across the world as you can imagine from working in the UN system um who are my peers but who are younger Mm -hmm. and they stay in touch I mean not for any big consequential communication but but they're in touch and every now and again somebody reminds me of a time or a story when you know they needed a hand and it was there and I often don't even remember those moments, right. but it was important to that person at that time. And I, I try very hard not to lose the ability to see when people need that hand mm. and to extend it. Because I'm imagining people re- extended a hand to you. So it's Indeed. both sides and maybe still. Exactly. Both, right? People were generous to me um, for whatever reason, they spotted some potential. Um, men and women. I mean, I was I was lucky to have crossed paths with people who really, without maybe even knowing, helped set me on a trajectory that I wasn't even planning for myself. 
So I'm thinking about how we're under so much transition and change in the international humanitarian um, sector, the global sector. I, you guys are in peace building. And there's a, as, but, and you know, through the pandemic and with George Floyd being murdered, there's been a lot of push for change. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of leaders with all the best intention and wanting to move their organization, the sector to a, to a, a better fit, a place that's a better fit for their organization. So it's, it's very hard right now to lead in this confusing, unclear time. So I wonder how, how when you've been in that kind of place of significant change, because I know you have done, been in organizations that are going under massive transformations. How do you, I guess it's two questions, take know that you're, what do you say to yourself? We're going to get through this, even though I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Like, I don't know what you say to yourself. And then how do you turn to the others and say, we're going to be okay through this, even though we don't know what the heck's going on? Um, if I speak from the leader perspective, I've always said to myself uh, that I need to offer others three things. Mm. One is to be consistent and predictable in, you know, how I'm going to deal with things or react to things to be, to be fair and to, to listen and to take in different points of view and then to be accountable for the decisions I take and to stand by them. But clarity I find helps in a leader when when people know that you've listened to different points of view but you've taken a decision um and we're going to stick with it indecision i find is really destructive in a leader at this time because everything else is so fluid and so confusing that um i find leaders need to be willing to truly lead to make a decision maybe change it sometimes because it wasn't a great decision. It wasn't a good decision at the time, but to do it transparently and to um, be clear that this is where we're going because you have your microcosm of your organization in a microcosm that's <laughs> we can't control and it's fluid and confusing. And so inside that microcosm that you can control, some guardrails of predictability, fairness, transparency, I think, help. And for yourself? How oh, do you, I, oh, you I, I garden. <laughs> I like that because it was unexpected. Gardening people. I you garden live and in I, an apartment. And I go by water often. I'm I'm from the Caribbean. Being close to water is sort of very nourishing for me. So I seek those things out. So it's very much knowing that you're going through, this is a challenging time, and the elements that aren't about work, water, gardening, nature, that's making sure that you have are doing those things. You don't eschew them. Yes, um, because I need to remember to nourish myself in order to give the best of me to others. That's good. Thank you. Um, so you've you've said in you've said earlier, you know, leadership. You're wondering if leadership could be taught and or learned. And so, do you want to talk more about that? Is the thing you're not? Are you born a leader, or can this be something we um, hone ourselves for? I don't know that we're born a leader. Um, you know, there used to be the theory that you had to be a big extrovert once upon a time, you know, mm -hmm. fill the room with your personality. And that's actually not who I am. Um, I'm not an introvert, per se. I mean, if you think of the Myers-Briggs framework, I'm, I am an I. Um, but I think leadership needs you to be conscious that you're you're creating a space for others to be in 
that needs to um, encourage their development. Um, leadership really is about others. It's not about me per se. Mm. And so I, I think leadership can be taught. What you do have to have is the desire to lead. Uh, and then you have to figure out how to do it well. Mm. Not everybody wants that responsibility. And it's okay. Um, it's a big responsibility. But if you take it, you shouldn't dabble. You should be really intentional because you are responsible for the well-being of a lot of people and for the mission or whichever mission you're pursuing. But delivering on a mission, but also enabling people to to do their best work, to want to come to work, to want to be part of the journey of your organization. So it's it's a responsibility that you must be prepared to to assume and to be conscious that it is really all about others. Which sometimes we forget. It's easy to forget. I think it's about how we're shining. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else you wanted to say that, that we didn't touch on today? Um, maybe just to say that coaching the best out of people is really something that mm -hmm. I think is, is satisfying work. Um, especially when you have progressed yourself, you know, past a certain stage of your own life. And it's no longer about climbing a ladder or realizing some personal goal. You're still in the workplace um, and your focus needs to shift to being the person who enables others to be their best selves. And that's when I feel satisfied. Mm. <laughs> that I, I see colleagues thriving and they may or may not know the direct cause of whatever enabled them to do that. And it doesn't matter. For me to observe that gives me great personal satisfaction when other people can do their best work. I can help make that happen. And the way that I think about that is then that makes the it it facilitates the organization achieving its mission and vision. If people are Absolutely. doing their best work, yeah. it isn't that isn't the end in itself. Then my theory is then the organization will thrive and achieve its mission and vision. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what that's about, people. That's that's about people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. It okay. can't be done without people. Even if, even in the light of AI, we yeah. still need people. Exactly. So thank you, Marjorie, for being here. Thanks for coming on the podcast. And I wanted to let everyone know that in September, we'll be hosting an executive forum to talk about organizational change. Um, so in the show notes, there'll be a link to that. And Marjorie, you're, of course, we'd love to have you come and participate in that also. Um, so some of the things we touched on today, we'll be talking about there, but I'm so really thank you for taking the time. I know you're really busy and um, for your vulnerability and, and you know, just coming up here and being yourself and telling us um, about your journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. It's a pleasure. All right. All right. See you on the next one. Bye. Bye bye.